President, fellows and guests, thank you very much for inviting me to give part of this presentation. In the year 1611, the squire of Little Crosby, William Blundell, buried an elderly tenant who had been refused burial in the Protestant graveyard on grounds of being a Catholic in an old ecclesiastical site on his land called the Harkirk. In the process, a servant named Thomas found some ancient coins which had been disturbed by the digging. A total of about 80 turned up, none bigger than a groat and none less than a two pence. And William Blundell went on to, to write a sort of um, essay on his findings. This is a picture of the Harkirk as it now is, a sort of memorial chapel. And these are some of the few remnants of uh, the Harkirk as it was in, in the time of William Blundell and shortly after headstones set into the outside wall of the more recent chapel. This map and, and the sort of blow up of it indicates to you the physical relationship between Crosby Hall, where William Blundell lived, and the Harkirk, which is the site I've marked with a white cross on the right hand map. Looking at a, a modern map turned on its side for, you know, so that it matches with the 72 one, you can similarly see that it's a very short walk from the Harkirk site to Crosby Hall. Now, William investigated the origins of the coins that he had found in the light of the education which he'd received on the continent. He carefully drew 35 of them and had a copper plate engraving made from his drawing. Most of the coins themselves were subsequently lost during the Civil War, while those that remained were melted down and turned into a chalice and a pyx, which is what Dora will be talking about. Now, as, as you can sort of see just from the engraving, these are Anglo-Saxon coins, which typically give the name of the king for whom they were struck, and so he was able to relate them to the known succession of Anglo-Saxon kings, which he could have accessed through a variety of sources, such as William Camden. His actual source of information on Old English for reading these coins is from a recusant writer, Richard Verstegen's Restitution of Decayed Intelligence, which was published in Antwerp. You can tell this, I think, most specifically from the passage quoted here, where he's looking at coins of Alfred, Wilfred, Al or possibly Old Frith, and St. Wilfred of York. Um, puzzling over these coins, but he's, he's saying that actually these are all the same name, um, Wolfred, because Frid and Fred are one signifying peace. Um, he's actually quite wrong, but th this is you know, the, best, the best he could do with this. So to, to, this is what Verstegen says here. Fred and Fred are all one. The V consonant does oftentimes hold the place of F. Um, and this is our ancient word for peace. Um, actually, Wilfred is something quite different. It's will peace, but uh, never mind. Now, it's clear that the, con the immediate intellectual context for this at least in part, is the contemporary interest in coins. They put the quotation on here that it is agreed to upon among all learned men there arises very much light the illustration of English ancient histories out of ancient coins. Now that is not in the original Latin edition of Camden's Britannia, but it is in the English translation which came out in 1610, just the year before the Harkirk discoveries. Blundell is, in, in his interest in coins, very much at the forefront of, forefront of um, the developing antiquarian tradition within English. But he did not derive his knowledge from the same sources as Camden. 
He was a member of the first post-Reformation generation of English Catholics to study in an English college abroad at Dowie. So his cultural formation was simultaneously English and oppositional. And in fact, the immediate intellectual context of his work is recusant controversial literature. He tells a story about King Alfred and St Cuthbert at considerable length. This is copied absolutely verbatim for about five pages from Robert Parsons' extremely tendentious treatise of three conversions of England, which itself is based on William of Malmesbury. Bede is another important source for him. His account of King Aldfrith and Wilfred, Archbishop of York, comes from Bede, whose painstaking demonstration of Anglo-Saxon obedience to Rome was, of course, valued by recusants. But his understanding of the Anglo-Saxon world is informed by the Elizabethan battle for the Anglo-Saxon past, claimed for Protestantism by writers such as Stowe, and for Catholics by Verstegen. It's much more important to him than pre-conquest sources. For instance, he doesn't cite Asser, the biographer of King Alfred, though Asser was in print. His most important sources are post-conquest writers, most particularly William of Malmesbury. The copy that he owned was an, in a volume edited by Henry Savile, which was published in Frankfurt. He also regards Polydore Virgil as an authority. And Virgil's Historia was not published in England. His Catholicism and his scepticism towards the legends of Brutus and King Arthur made his work quite unacceptable in a post-Reformation English environment. Now, Blundell cites Virgil on the issue of Peter's Pence and on King Alfred's monastic foundations. The list here is the list which I have extracted from Blundell's essay on the coins of the authorities that he names and cites. He's familiar with uh, Fox's Acts and Monuments, but like Parsons, is highly wary of Fox's interpretations of the past. What do you really notice is that all the writers he regards as authoritative are Catholic. The massive seven-volume History of the Saints by Laurentius Sorius, Robert Bellarmine, and Petrus de Natalibus, a pre-Reformation hagiographer. And I think another thing that's worth observing is how much of his library was printed abroad. The only book he cites issued in England are those of John Fox, John Stowe, and William Camden. And he directly challenges the interpretations of both Camden and Fox. Now, the quotation at the top of this slide is from a highly learned article on um, William Blundell and his discoveries. But this is one of the things that prompted us to think about um, Blundell again. Because it says he has struggling minor gentlemen, both regionally, because he lived in rural Lancashire, and religiously, as a firm recusant, he was outside the mainstream. And we started to ask ourselves, what mainstream? Remember that many English Catholic books, such as Verstegen, are printed in centres such as Antwerp or Dowie or St. Omer's. A determined recusant like Blundell was in the habit of importing the bulk of his books. And although Little Crosby may be a long way from London, thus regionally outside the mainstream, he is less than three miles from the Irish Sea. <coughs> That's the red arrow there is pointing to Little Crosby down at the mouth of the Mersey John, from John Speed's mouth in Lancashire of 1610. In fact, um, a captured priest who was persuaded to recant, Thomas Bell, specifically says that visiting priests have many times brought books from beyond the seas to Little Crosby. Now, Blundell read Latin with ease. The works that he chooses to cite show he's looking beyond the recusant apologetics of Parsons. He is perceiving English history as an aspect of Catholic and providential history more generally, in a way which is not quite like that of his Protestant contemporaries, 
In fact, his outlook is not provincial. It's supranational. And his narrative has resonances with cultural production of the recent Catholic community more widely, as we find in Jesuit college drama and in material objects, like the imaginary portraits of Saxon monarchs, of which there are two different sets, one for the English college in Valladolid and one for the English Bridgetines in Lisbon. These are an explicit claim to authentic, historically continuous Englishness, defined in terms of saintly royal Catholicism and, of course, a rebuke to their degenerate successors. The Saxons, similarly, play a prominent role in the allegorical history plays written by masters and performed by pupils in the exiled Catholic colleges. William Drury's play Alaredus, i.e. Alfred, I think alerts us to the reading of history which Blundell developed as a recusant Catholic educated at the English College, which when he attended it was in Reims, where a distinctive historiography was emerging and a variety of plays on English historical themes were written and performed. William Drury was Professor of Rhetoric at Dowie, where his play Alaredus was staged. It's about the dark hour of 878, when Alfred and a handful of survivors are forced into the Somerset marshes by the pagan Danes, who seem to have secured near total victory over England, a theme to resonate with recusants who were similarly pushed towards extinction by the state's determined effort to eradicate them. Now, the narrative is based on the 12th century story from a text called The Translation of St Cuthbert, which Blundell knew in the version redacted by Parsons. And the involvement of Neothus, i.e. St Neot, in his narrative, and the information given about him suggests that Drury was also familiar with the 11th century life of St Neot. Now, what I find interesting is that both Blundell and Drury evidently attach considerable significance to writers from the 11th and 12th century. In Blundell's case, William of Malmesbury, but also Roger of Hoveton, Florence of Worcester, and Il Ingulf of Croyland. And I'm not sure this is adventitious, because there's a variety of post-conquest writers who are concerned to emphasize the importance of the Anglo-Saxon past to their new Norman overlords. So these works parade a series of highly virtuous monarchs, obedient to the church, their virtues rewarded by a variety of miracles. Now these serve a contemporary agenda. They offer warning and examples to the heirs of William the Conqueror. But in the 17th century, they also serve the ends of recusant writers because they present an image of a harmonious and well-ordered Catholic Saxon world. One, of course, to which the Blundells felt connected. In the family tree which is preserved in the British Library, family memory stretches back as far as the William Blundell of Ince, who flourished in the 12th century. So Drury's Aluradus is highly consonant with Blundell's reading of the coins, where he is insistent on presenting the kings he names as Christian monarchs, whose virtue is confirmed by miracles. Jury's Alfred is a perfect Christian prince, an obedient son of the church. The Saxons are the true English, harried by the invading, persecuting Danes, just as they are for Blundell. Now, William Blundell's narrative about his Saxon coins is not the only memorial recorded by the Blundells in the 17th century. There's a bound manuscript, charmingly called the Great Hodgepodge, which shows that as a family they were in the habit of recording texts and events. It contains memorials of various kinds, events in Blundell lives, their community and the House of Crosby. Songs and ballads against the Reformation, literary texts which were statements of belief. The hodgepodge, in fact, moves into a specific mode of recusant Catholic historiography, the record of the sufferings for the faith in England, considered over a very long period of time, starting with St Alban and moving through Thomas Becket to Campion Sherwin and Bryant. A kind of history which is fixed by the publication of engraved versions of the wall paintings in the English College in Rome, the Trophia Ecclesiae Anglicana. 
So Blundell makes three responses to the Harkirk hoard. One is the manuscript notes belonging to his posterity and his essay. The second, the engraving as which I showed you, which flew abroad in the country, as he said, thus linking it to the wider community of people interested in the British past, though his decision to arrange the coins in the shape of a cross suggests its particular Catholic interest. And thirdly, he melts it down, he melts down the silver and makes it into a pyx, as, and indeed a chalice now lost. These consecrated objects are a thank offering, object offered by time, by the history that he understands into timelessness, the internal present of a gift concentrated, consecrated to God. So having appreciated and expounded the history of the silver of the coins, it's transformed, refashioned, and sent forth less to posterity than out of time altogether. So Blundell's, in Blundell's sense of history, he sees himself as part of a sequence of parallels with historical times and events enacted in the eye of eternity, just as the Jesuit college plays ransack the past for the parallels and analogies with the present condition of the English Catholic community. President, fellows and guests, uh, thank you, Jane. I am talking about just one object and trying to find a context and a series of comparisons for it as a way of saying something about William Blundell and his culture at Little Crosby, following on from Jane's talk. The Blundell Pix, as you've heard from Jane, was made from coins in the Harkirk Hoard, which were discovered in April 1611 on the Little Crosby estate. Documents and objects recording the hoard have now been generously placed on loan to the British Museum by William Blundell's direct descendants, the Blundell family of Little Crosby. I'm showing you here the opening of Blundell's book, which records the find, and in the next slide, I'm showing you the binding of that notebook made from a medieval manuscript, the Benedictite. A second notebook records burials of the Harkirk, while another manuscript details the coins. There's also the engraved copper plate, which Jane mentioned, for producing private prints, and this is part of the group, allowing Blundell to publicise the discovery to antiquarians and fellow Catholics. These pieces tell a remarkable story, yet the Pix, which is made, as you've heard, from melted down silver coins from the hoard, is almost unknown as an object, and its intellectual context, status and significance have never been clearly understood. Blundell melted down some of the coins to make a chalice and a pyx for use at Little Crosby and at the Harkirk. The chalice is lost, though some evidence of what it might have looked like is provided by a group of locally surviving, though not necessarily locally produced, chalices of the same period. Writing on recusant silver, Charles Oman pointed out that the plate of an English manor house chapel was as much the property of the squire as was the loving cup and the great salt on his dinner table, a statement which is borne out by surviving examples and their provenances. A silver gilt chalice of around 1600 from Sefton Hall, the seat of North Molyneux near to the Blundells, is currently displayed in the Metropolitan Cathedral Treasury in Liverpool, and it's known as the St Bennet Chalice after the parish of that name. I'm showing it to you here on the left. It's inscribed and dated under the foot for Father Ambrose Shirley, the chaplain at Sefton, who received it at his ordination in 1603. On the right is the Lydiate chalice, dating from the late 16th century, which came from the parish of Our Lady in Lydiate, next to Little Crosby. Travelling chalices in Pewter also survive locally, one at Lydiate and another in Liverpool Metropolitan Cathedral. Although the Blundell chalice made from part of the Harcourt Hoard is now unrecorded, the accompanying pix has come down to us. It's about this big. It was used to carry Holy Communion to the sick and the dying and has an attachment loop at the top so that it can be worn around the neck. Its function clearly links with the making of the graveyard at the Harkirk as an act of charity on the part of William Blundell. It's gilded inside where the inner surface would touch the consecrated host. The front is engraved with a simple image of the crucifixion probably from a banned devotional print imported from the continent, 
with a skull at the foot of the cross and an emphasis on Christ's blood streaming from his wounds. This could be held up in front of the sick to be venerated or kissed. Most known post-Reformation pixies therefore have a crucifixion scene engraved on the front. And typically, they have an Agnus Dei, or Lamb of God, on the back. But on the back of the Blundell pics, there is a decorative cartouche, like that on an estate or country map, which is inscribed, This was made of silver found in the burial place, William Blundell. Pixies were among the items which were banned in the 1559 injunctions, which demanded the destruction of the outward forms of Catholic worship, so that there remained no memory of the same. A liturgical object that appears to have been made in response to the injunctions is the peacock cup, shown here, which is from St Martin Ludgate in the City of London and is now in the Museum of London. Its foot is made from a standing pix marked for London 1507-8, which has had its container replaced with a communion cup of the former proof of parish worship in 1559. It was given to St Martin's Ludgate by Stephen and Margaret Peacock for the worship of the sacrament, a phrase which perhaps hints at some sense of continuity of sacramental function, from prescribed picks to approved cup. Other pixies did not fare so well. At Broughton in Lincolnshire in 1566, for example, two pixies are described as being defaced and given away by Richard Hyde and Robert Lightfoot, church wardens, this year unto a child to play with all. The practice of Catholicism was dependent on, on a considerable variety of material objects the more so in that priests were only sporadically available to English Catholics. A useful folding sheet in the Protestant book A New Year's Gift, dedicated to the Pope's Holiness, printed in London in 1579, illustrates certain of the Pope's merchandise lately sent over into England, a practice forbidden by a bill of 1571 against imports of papal bulls and other Catholic instruments. But prints such as these, which were intended to serve as a Protestant warning, actually had the opposite effect in identifying objects of veneration for the faithful. A representation of what seems to be a pix, very like the Harkirk one, with the crucifixion on one side, but the Agnus Dei more conventionally on the other, shares a place in the print with Agnus Dei medallions and is perhaps misdescribed as Agnus Dei in the caption. It's shown alongside rosaries and holy medals arranged around a devotional woodcut, with a cross on the left, perhaps made from cut-out paper, recalling Blundell's arrangement of his Anglo-Saxon coin finds. Pixies took on a special significance within a hidden community that was often scattered, frequently deprived of priests and the sacraments. They were also used by priests who were on the run, in hiding, or in prison. Their message was one of unity and secret resistance. Gregory Gunnis confessed to the authorities in 1585 that he had kept two consecrated hosts in a silver pyx since Queen Mary's day, as the Catholic Church doth. George Knapper, who was educated for the priesthood of Reims and sent on the English mission in 1603, was arrested near Woodstock in Oxfordshire and found to possess a small reliquary and a pyx with two hosts in it. On this basis, he was arrested and charged with being a priest and then executed. The Jesuit John Gerard managed to sustain a clandestine existence as a priest in England for several years, but was eventually arrested, finally sent to the Tower of London. He managed to have a pix with hosts smuggled in so that he could celebrate secret masses while imprisoned there. He'd already demonstrated his gift for creating a sacred space around himself when he recognised the first cell into which he was taken in the Tower knowing he was to be tortured there as the former cell of the martyr, Father Henry Walpole. I imagine he did that because of the graffiti carved in the wall which survives to this day. I'm afraid you have to put up with my rather amateurish photograph. Gerard dedicated himself to cutting rosaries out of orange peel, which he sent as gifts, wrapped in paper on which he'd written news of himself in orange juice, the idea being that you could read this when held up against the light of a fire. But his efforts to require a pix with hosts within it were similarly subtle and painstaking. He records that he asked a fellow prisoner, quote, to let his wife call at a certain place in London, having previously sent word to John Lilly where he should give her, what he should give her to bring. I told him to send a pix and a number of small hosts that I might be able to reserve the blessed sacrament. He provided all I told him and the good lady got them safely to her husband's cell. So on the appointed day, I went over with my jailer 
and stayed with my fellow prisoner that night and the next day. But the jailer exacted a promise that not a word of this was to be said to the gentleman's wife. The next morning then said I mass to my great consolation, and that confessor of Christ communicated after having been so many years deprived of that favour. In this mass I consecrated also two and twenty particles which I reserved in the pyx with a corporal, and these I took back with me to my cell, and for many days renewed the divine banquet with ever fresh delight and consolation. The sense that a pyx was property linked with a parish or a family is inscribed on the Harcourt pyx was traditional in England before the Reformation. And for example, the Swinburne Pix in the Victorian Albert Museum, dating from 1310 to 25, as shown here, was held by one family for 17 generations. Charles Oman noted that it was likely to have continued in use after the Reformation when little new ecclesiastical silver was made within the requisite community. Oman says, it's attractive to suppose that the defacement of the side of the pyx was the unhappy inspiration of a 16th century recusant chaplain who sought to disguise the sacred character of the little box. He may also have pasted roundels, paper roundels, over the top and bottom, preserving the engraving but doing irretrievable damage to the enamel. Certainly the defacement cannot have been the work of a Protestant who would hardly have failed to obliterate the figure of the virgin. There's a standing virgin uh, with a child in her arms on the top. The recusant associations which are played out on the pre-Reformation Swinburne Pix by the family who owned it point to the context within which the Blundell Pix was commissioned by William Blundell and used at the Harkirk and Little Crosby. A Pix, as Gerard makes clear in the account I quoted, was of particular importance to a persecuted community for whom regular celebration of the Mass was impossible. Whenever Pixes were discovered, they were swiftly, dis swiftly destroyed by the Protestant authorities which means that British pixies of this period are very rare indeed. The grandest survivor, which may be almost contemporary with the Blundell pix, is now at Westminster Cathedral. It is a shallow, round container with a hinged lid, which is engraved on both sides and very thickly gilded inside and out, probably 17th century in date. On the top is the crucifix seen against the background of the city of Jerusalem, finely engraved within sun's rays and an egg and dark border. On the inside of the lid is a sacred monogram and a border of rays, and the underside has the Agnus Dei with lamb's fleece and tail, again skillfully rendered with hatching and stippling. An ornate suspension loop is attached to the hinge of the lid. Apart from its quality, this pix is also the only English one to bear a maker's mark. This is stamped inside the container in a very visible position and takes the form of a unicorn's head, a mark which is also found on a secular cup all marked for London 1612. Charles Oman suggested that this date would also suit the Pix, which, if so, would make it only a year later than the Blundell Pix. The Westminster Cathedral Pix is very unusual also for having a contemporary verse which was custom made for it, possibly French, tapestry woven in silver gilt thread and silk and lined with cream coloured silk, although the drawstring itself is a more recent replacement that has been attached to the wonderful, splendid tassels which are original. The bag is woven on one side with a Jesuit emblem of a heart with the IHS upon it and three nails above with a lance and the sponge of Christ's passion. And on the other side is a crucifix on top of a heart within a crown of thorns flanked by stems of vines. The verse is probably Parisian and cannot be closely dated due particularly to the lack of obvious parallels for it. Charles Truman dated both verse and pix to about 1620, no great distance from Oman's dating of 1612. This slightly later date might allow us to link both pieces as Jesuit commissions to the Queen's Chapel of Henrietta Maria or to the chapel of a Catholic ambassador at the court of Charles I. But out in the shires, particularly in Lancashire, the old faith was harder to suppress than in London, and there have been recent, few recent finds of pixies in Lancashire which resemble the Blundell example from the Harkirk. This one, which was found by a metal detectorist at Houghton in Lancashire, was reported through the Treasure Act in, in March 2015, and was recently, I'm very pleased to say, acquired by the Preston Museum. It's a simple piece. The front, which is damaged and crushed, depicts Christ on the cross with the Virgin Mary and St. John. An inscription around the scene is inscribed in Latin from the Revelations, to him who overcomes, I will give hidden manna. The lamb on the reverse is inscribed, behold the lamb of God, behold he who takes away the sins of the world. 
A pix which is now in Chicago in the Loyola University has a crucifixion scene on the front with words translated, by the holy blood of Christ we are cleansed of sin, inscribed around it. And the face with the anus has, learn of me because I am meek and humble of heart, from Matthew 11 verse 29. Higher in quality than these rather humble objects is a silver gilt pyx currently at Stoneyhurst College in Lancashire. This shows Christ crucified with the emblems of the Passion, the armour Christi arranged around him. Circling the image is the Latin inscription, you who have suffered for us, have mercy on us. On the underside of this pyx is engraved the Lamb of the Apocalypse, with the unusual iconography of a stream of blood pouring from the Lamb into the chalice, inscribed, Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. The silver band that joins the two sides of the object is engraved, God will not abandon anyone who hopes in him, in Latin. The Houghton Pix, which is now in Preston, might offer a clue as to where the Harkirk Pix was made, as it can be compared directly with an Irish Pix, which was given in 2013 by the Congregation of the Sisters of Mercy at Nina County Tipperary to the National Museum of Ireland. It belonged to James Phelan, the Bishop of Ossory, from 1669 to 1695, sorry, those dates are wrong, 59 to 1695, and according to local translate tradition, was presented to him in 1647. The Sisters of Mercy have kept with it a chalice and a pattern commissioned by Phelan and dated 1689, which was presented to them on their first arrival in Nina in 1854 by the Bishop of Killaloe. The sacred vessels were once thought to have belonged to the suppressed Franciscan Abbey in Nina, but they're now thought to be associated with patrons of Holy Cross Abbey. The Sisters of Mercy Pix has a crucified Christ with the armour Christi on one side, and the Annus Dei and the Latin inscription, Behold the Lamb of God, roughly engraved around its border, in a way which recalls the Houghton Pix. But it's also inscribed, Behold God, whom neither the netherworld nor earth nor the heavens can contain, is entirely here in a little Pix. John Joseph Phelan had me made, with the date 1647. That raises the question of whether the Blundell Picks could have been made in Southern Ireland. Little Crosby is only three miles from the coast of the Irish Sea and therefore reasonably close to the goldsmiths who could make sacred silver freely in the coastal cities of Dublin, Wexford and Waterford. Links with Ireland were not unknown to William Blundell himself. In his notebook recording burials of the Harkirk, there's a reference in his own hand to the burial of John Sinet, who he describes as an Irishman born in Wexford, master of a, of a bark, who was excommunicated by the Bishop of Chester for being a Catholic recusant, and so dying at his house in Liverpool, was denied to be buried at Liverpool Church or Chapel, and therefore was brought and buried in this said burial place of the Harkirk in the afternoon of the last day of August, 1613. If nothing else, this indicates the closeness of Ireland and the presence of an Irish master mariner in William's Blundell's immediate circle, just two years after the picks was made. A fair number of Irish chalices of this period are preserved in cathedral treasuries in Limerick and Liverpool and in museums such as the Victorian Albert and the Hunt Museum in Limerick. They're quite different from English ones in that they're solid and not designed to be taken apart quickly and hidden like the English ones. They're not hallmarked, but they're outstanding for their inscriptions recording patronage, ownership and provenance, which are often dated. Irish pixies, however, are much less well known. There's a small but really important group of them, circular and oval, probably 17th and 18th century, in the Hunt Museum in Limerick. The most important is engraved with the IHS with a cross over the head and a heart below. There's an inscription around the sides which reads, Edmundus Tadeus Sacerdos me fieri fecit, and the date 1636, Edmund McTighg Priest had me made in 1636. It's a very different object to the Blundell Pix, but fascinating as a priest's personal possession in a country where Catholic worship was, to a degree, tolerated by the authorities. It would be tempting to attribute the Harcourt Pix to Ireland, but in a Catholic world, which was united by Virix's devotional engravings, such as this one after Dürer, any certain attribution without the evidence of a hallmark is impossible to make, and it remains a mystery. The Blundell Pix's inscription, in place of the Agnes Day, must represent a deliberate choice on the part of William Blundell as patron. It records him as the finder who is returning the silver found in the burial place to the church, as Jane explained. It's unique in what it has to tell us about his sense of family and of parish, feelings more commonly expressed on Irish church silver of this period, 
which is often inscribed with references to individuals, marriages, deaths, the names of priests or patrons, and of places, allowing networks of patronage to be identified and mapped onto patterns of local land holding. The Blundell Pix exudes a sense of place, topographical, spiritual, and historical. It's part of his sense of lineage, in the same way as this genealogy of the Blundell family from the visitation of Lancashire compiled in his lifetime, which is in the British Library, Harleian Manuscripts. Blundell seems to have regarded his extraordinary hoard of silver Anglo-Saxon coins, many of them stamped with a cross, as he's recorded in his notebook, almost as relics of a happier Catholic past in England. Perhaps he also saw the Harkirk hoard as a reward for his act of charity, as Jane explained, in founding a graveyard for his local community, an unexpected gift from heaven, as his grandson put it in 1686. The fact that he simultaneously started one notebook recording the coins and a second notebook of the same format regarding the burials at the Harkirk shows, I think, how these two elements were entwined in his thinking. While in prison for recusancy in the 1590s, he'd written a ditty lamenting the fracturing of the Catholic past in England. The time has been we had one faith and strode aright one ancient path. The time is now that each man may see new religions coined each day. Given his remarkable coin find 20 years later, the coining simile and the fact that he identified Catholicism with custom, tradition and stability is particularly fascinating. It gives us a good idea of his formation and thinking before he stumbled on this extraordinary hoard, which would take such an exceptional significance in his understanding of Catholic history in England. The inscription of ownership and origin on the Blundell Picks takes us to the heart of his sensibility as a persecuted Catholic landowner in Lancashire in 1611. Thank you for listening. <laughs>